Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. In three months, more than 250 cars have been broken into. Property mounting well into thousands of dollars has been stolen. Two youthful members of the gang have been apprehended. The all-important brains of the criminal ring, the leaders, are still at large. Your job, get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, March 2nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night shift out of auto theft. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the interrogation room, and it was 10.58 p.m. when I got to room 26, chief of detectives' office. Real tough kids, aren't they? Yeah, they won't admit a thing. Now, sit down. Thanks. When did you pick him up? Well, about 8.30 tonight in the parking lot behind the Star Theater out on Sunset. He was lifting the radio out of a 48 convertible. He's had lots of experience. The report says you picked up a 19-year-old girl with him. She was waiting for the guy in a parked car across the street from the theater. The car was full of loot. Uh, the first real break we've had on those auto burglaries in three months, and it's no good to us. Well, neither one of them will talk. They won't even admit they know each other. You run makes on them? Just did. We've been questioning the boy for an hour, getting nowhere. Uh, what's his name again? Freeman. Stanley Freeman. Oh, uh, yeah. Age 20. Address? Butte, Montana. Down here for a vacation. Uh, he doesn't lie very well, Ed. He's never been to Butte, Montana in his life. Knows less about the town than I do. Well, get to him. Right, Ed. Where'd you put the girl? We had a policewoman take her to our office. We can talk to her when we finish with the boy. Well, what's her story? Hasn't any. She won't even open her mouth. Nineteen years old. Probably needs a good spanking. Now get him to talk. Right. Make, Joe? Yeah, he's clean. Get wise, huh, Flatfoot? Look, you're in a bad spot, son. That kind of talk isn't going to help. Says you. We caught you red-handed trying to steal a radio that didn't belong to you from a car it didn't belong to you. Is that right? That's enough to send you to San Quentin, boy. You better give us the story. Shut up. We've got all the evidence we need for him. Maybe you don't realize how serious this is. We've had more than 250 car burglaries in this city in the past three months. Over $200,000 worth of property's been stolen. That's a lot of money. So what? So you're the number one suspect, young fellow. Your method of operation in breaking into that car tonight is the same used in most of the other burglaries. That means you're not going to be tried just for this job tonight. What are you getting at, Flatfoot? Listen, son. In the state of California, breaking into a locked car is a felony. You can go to state penitentiary for that. And we're going to file a complaint of burglary with the district attorney in the morning. You say you're from Butte, Montana. All right, I don't believe you, but we'll make sure. Ben, go down to our office and call the news photographers. Stanley here is going to have his picture on the front page of every newspaper in Los Angeles tomorrow. All right, Joe. No. You can't. I won't let you. I got my rights. What's the matter, youngster? Everybody wants his picture in the paper. Yeah, well, I don't. I won't let him. We got your picture already for him, remember? They took it when they fingerprinted you. You can't use it. You can't. I'll get a lawyer. Reporters will be over in a couple of minutes. We have to give him your story and your picture, too. Uh, this one. You won't. You won't. Give it all to right, me. All right, all right. Give it to all me. All right, Freeman, get your hands off him. Now sit down. All right. Now let's have it straight. Oh, don't let him use the picture. Don't let him. You can't. You can't. 
We gotta have the truth, son. <laughs> now look, you're 20 years old. You know right from wrong. You'll have to take your medicine. If you cooperate, we'll do all we can to help. I... I live out in the Wilshire district. All I wanted was a little extra money. We didn't take much. We didn't think it was so wrong. It was stealing, Freeman. You know that's wrong. Where do you live out there? Piper Avenue. 821 Piper. You won't give him my picture. You live there with your family? Yeah, my mother. Father's dead. Uh, promise me you won't give him the picture. My mother, she'd see it. Uh, promise me. You're working with a gang on those auto burglaries. We know that. Now, who are they? Where are they? And what's the setup? I can't. They get me for it. Who'd get you? I can't tell you. I can't. Who's your girlfriend, Stanley? The one you were with tonight. Joanne. Joanne Miller. Where does she live? Piper Avenue, same as me. Lives on the same block, 866. Is that her home? She live there with her folk? Yeah. Mother and father. They work. And you got her into this. Isn't that the story she gave us, Ben? I did not. I didn't. It was her. She said a bunch of kids were doing it. It was quick money, something to do at night. She started it. All right, Romero. I'll go see the girl. You stay here with Freeman. All right, Joe. Just stay put in that chair for him. Hi, Marge. Hello, Joe. You and Romero handling this case? Yeah. I'd like to talk to the girl a few minutes, Marge. Will you stand by? Right. I'll sit over here. Thanks. All right, miss. What's your name, age, and address? I told this lady cop 15 minutes ago I'm not saying anything. All right, then we'll tell you. Your name's Joanne Miller. You live at 866 Piper Avenue. You live with your father and mother. Both of them work. You're a liar. That's not me. You're 19 years old. You live on the same block as your boyfriend, Stanley Freeman, and you're the one who got him mixed up in this gang. Isn't that right? No, it's not right. It's not. I didn't do anything. Well, that's only half the story. Freeman told us everything. You want to hear the rest? No. Stan wouldn't tell you. He wouldn't. He told us how you got him mixed up in it. Quick money. That's what you told him, didn't you? No, it was him. I can prove it. The rest of the kids will tell you. He got me in this. Ask them, they'll tell you. It was Stanley and Fred Milford and George Jansen. They started it, all three of them. All right. Will you tell the story to a police stenographer? I'll tell him everything. He's not blaming this on me. Marge, will you go get the stenographer? Right. Now, how many persons in this gang of yours? Oh, about ten or twelve. And it's not my gang, either. He got me into this, and now he's trying to lie his way out, blaming me. How long have you been doing this, burglarizing cars? Me? Oh, only about two weeks. It was supposed to be fun, something to do at night. The rest of them have been at it a couple of months. Who's the head of the gang? I told you, it's him, Stanley, and Fred Milford and Jansen, all three. I only started going out with them two weeks ago, maybe less. All right, Joanne. Tell it to the stenographer the same way. Stenographer will be in a minute, Joe. Okay, Marge, thanks. Stay with it. Right, Joe. Just about a closed case, Ben. Girl gave us a full confession. She didn't. Oh, you're not tricking me again. She didn't. She told us you're one of the leaders of the gang, Stanley. Said you got her into all this. The other two are George Jansen and Fred Milford. About a dozen kids in the gang, all of them about your age. Isn't that right? She's lying, can't you tell? She's lying. She got me into the gang. Well, she did. She's Milford's girlfriend. Ask her. Oh, she can't lie out of that one. She got me into it. I can prove it. Who's the real leader of the gang? Milford. He, he started it. He organized the whole thing. He collects the stuff we get and he delivers it. Jansen helps him do it. What do you mean he delivers the stuff? Where does he deliver it? Well, somewhere in Dogtown, I think. Down around South Main, near the railroad yards. Who's it delivered to? Well, I don't know exactly. I heard Jansen mention the name once. Myra, he said, it's, it's supposed to be a big secret. Myra, that's that's all I remember. Where does Jansen and Milford live? Well, Jansen rooms down on East Flower. 1042, I think. It's, it's a rooming house. And Milford lives two blocks over from me on Quincy. 234 Quincy. He lives with his grandmother. Got that, Ben? Right. All right, let's pick up Milford and Jansen. It was ten minutes past one when Ben and I returned to headquarters with George Jansen and Fred Milford in our custody. 
In Jansen's room at 1042 East Flower Street, we found two fur coats, a box full of new car accessories, an S&W 38 revolver, and a 45 automatic. When we picked up Fred Milford at his home, we discovered five deluxe car radios hidden in the garage, plus a valuable assortment of cameras, cigarette lighters, and clothing. Both Jansen and Milford refused to talk. But when we got them to headquarters and showed them the signed statements of Stanley Freeman and the girl, Joanne Miller, they broke. Milford, um, where else did you and your gang operate besides the Wilshire district? No place. Only out there. That's all. Same type of car burglars have been committed all over the city. You telling us your gang didn't have a hand in them? It's the truth. Our territory was Wilshire district. We didn't go outside. You mean some other gang's responsible? I don't know. All I know is we didn't have any part of them. Is there another gang, Milford? Maybe. I don't know. You find out. It's none of my business. It is your business, Milford. You admit you and your gang committed 55 jobs in the past three and a half months. That leaves about 200 jobs to be accounted for. That's right. You figure it out. We have figured it out. I think you and your gang of young thieves pulled every one of those 250 jobs. There isn't any other gang. That's the story the district attorney's going to get. You're crazy. There is. I know there is. Then give us the information and save yourself a lot of trouble. Well, we're not the only ones. That's all I know. Milford, do you know how many years you get for auto burglary? I told you, we're not the only ones. There must be a couple of others besides us. Vince Mahoney, he's got a gang. Where does Mahoney operate? West Hollywood and Beverly. Where does he live? I don't know. Honest, I, I only met him a couple of times. Where'd you meet him? I don't remember. Where'd you meet him, Milford? Delivery. I met him down at the delivery place a couple of nights. When you delivered the property you stole from cars, is that right? Yeah. Where was that? Down by the railroad yards. Where? Shavis Street. It's a little alley off East Main. Who'd you deliver the stuff to? I told you. Her name's Myra. That's all I know. We meet her and some guy on Tuesday nights. We give them the stuff and they pay us off. Mahoney delivers the same night I do. Do you meet her every Tuesday night? Yeah. You're going to meet her this Tuesday? Tomorrow night? I don't know. I guess so. Same place? Yeah. Are you the only one she deals with? Sometimes Joanne. Me or Joanne... I know what you're thinking. You want to use me to trap Myra. Well, what's it worth? You know better than that. How about it, Milford? Oh, what else can I do? Give me another cigarette. By 3.30 that morning, the signed statements and confessions were piling up fast. Milford gave us a list of the names and addresses of each member in his gang, and within an hour, they were all under questioning at headquarters. Most of the suspects, about one-third of them girls, ranged in age from 18 to 21. As they told their individual stories, the scope of the case grew until it covered most of the city. By late afternoon of the next day, Tuesday, March 3rd, three more gangs operating in Venice, Bel Air, and North Hollywood had been apprehended. They confessed to more than 175 burglaries from locked cars during the past three and a half months. At five o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I met with Chief Backstrand in his office. How many admissions you have now? Over 50, Ed. Here are the gang leader's statements. Mm-hmm. What's this story? Well, it's pretty much the same. They all say this woman, Myra, set up the operation. You mean she got the kids and put them to work burglarizing cars? Well, not exactly. She picked the leaders, contacted them in bars or on the street, asked them if they wanted to pick up some spare money getting auto parts for it. Then she didn't tell them to go out and burglarize cars? Well, not in so many words, Ed, No. After they brought in auto parts for a couple of weeks, she told them to bring her everything they could find, outside the car or inside. Those are the words she used. Five of the kids dictated those words into their signed confession. Oh, that should hold in court. What else did you get on this woman? Oh, she taught them how to work, told them to wear gloves, all the angles. Uh, well, we got most of the small fry. Now, where do we find this Myra woman? Any description on her? Yeah. Kids say she's about 33, 34. Good-looking redhead. Five feet five, about 120. Well dressed. No description on the guy she runs with. You run a make on her yet? Yeah, no previous record. We set up a stakeout for her tonight. Two of the gang leaders have volunteered to go along, this Milford and Vince Mahoney. Uh, good. Down on uh, Chavez, where she usually meets them? Yeah, that's right. When? 11.15. That's the regular time for the meet, according to the kid. All right, I'll be at home. Call me. I don't want to miss out on this one. <laughs> When Ben and I left Ed Backstrand's office, we went home for dinner and a few hours sleep. At 9.30 p.m., we were back at the office. We met the men in the special detail which Backstrand had assigned for the stakeout that night. We briefed them on their duties, and then we got Fred Milford and Vince Mahoney out of their cells. To avoid any possible suspicion of the presence of a trap, 
we had Milford's permission to use his car in the stakeout. The car which he had said he had driven to the delivery meetings with the woman, Myra, at least a dozen times before. We arrived at the stakeout area, Chavez Alley in East Main, at 9.58. The meeting was scheduled for 11.15. The moon was out, but the sky was overcast, and there was a cold wind blowing from the east. Hey, what time you got, Sergeant? Mm, about 10. Why, Milford? Getting nervous? No, I just wonder. How are you cops going to rig this thing? In just a couple of minutes, we're going to plant you two in Milford's car parked up there in the alley. Now, you stay there until Myra shows up. We'll do the rest. Yeah, I know, but what'll we say? Suppose she asks for some stuff. We ain't got any. You won't need any. You won't have much time for talking. Hey, suppose she wises up. Maybe she'll pull a gun. Maybe. Does she carry one? No, never saw her with one. Don't worry, Milford. We'll make sure you're not in danger. She's got an awful temper, that redhead. Got mad at me once when I squawked at the prices she was paying us for radios. What was she paying you, Mahoney? Oh, an eight-tube radio, good shape, seven bucks. <laughs> she got all the gravy and you got all the grief. You're not kidding. Joe, hmm? are you? Yeah, Steve, what do you got? Well, the men are all staked out, Joe. Got the area covered from every angle. All right. You got an extra man to stay in Milford's car? I'll handle that myself. Fine, thanks. Okay. All set, Joe? Yeah. Now, Milford Mahoney, we're going to put you two in your car now. There's going to be an officer with you, so there's no need to be nervous or afraid. You just sit in the car and act natural. When this Myra drives up, don't leave the car. Have her come to you. You got it? Sure. Okay. All right, Joe, let's go. Sure is cold out. I don't even have a heater in my car. You stole enough of them. Okay, Steve, here they are. All right, boys. Milford, get in first behind the wheel. Okay. Mahoney in the middle. And now sit in the back. We'll be parked in that garage across the street, Steve. Got a perfect view of the alley. Okay, Ben. Check with you later. All right. Mean night, Joe. Yeah. Come on. cold here in the garage, isn't it? Yeah. And it might be a long wait. What time you got? Six minutes past ten. Thank you. Hey, Joe. What is it? Uh, it's nothing. Thought that passing car was turning in the alley. Relax. It's early. Lonely place. Dark. Gets on your nerves. That's it, Ben. Half past eleven. Nothing yet. Somebody might have tipped her off. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Now let's wait it out anyway. Joe, that blue coupe yeah, just turned in the alley. Let's go. Come on, run, Ben. Behind you. All right. Oh, wait, you fella. Quit your fight. Who'd you get, Steve? Uh, here he is. Just drove up in the coop. Got out and called Milford Mahoney by the first names. He's in on it. What about the girl? No sign. The kid was the only one in the car. All right. Tell them in the stakeout's offered and I'd have them report back in. We'll take the kid with us. Okay. All right, young fellow. This way. What do you cops think you're doing? I ain't done nothing. Look, sport. We heard that from 54 different kids yesterday. We're tired of that line. Come on. <laughs> When we got back to the office, we took the boy to the interrogation room and questioned him. He gave his name as Matthew Leiter, age 21. He wouldn't break until Vince Mahoney definitely identified him as a member of his car burglary gang and a special favorite of the red-headed woman they called Myra. Then Leiter copped out and told Ben and I that he had talked with Myra as late as 10 o'clock tonight. He told us that she had heard that the police had picked up some of the gang members and she asked Leiter to drive down to the Chavez Alley meeting place. He was supposed to tell Milford and Mahoney that the weekly delivery date was off until further notice. We questioned Matthew Leiter for an hour and a half. Uh, you told us a little while ago that you talked with this woman, Myra, late tonight. Yeah. Where'd you talk to her? At her home? At her home? Don't be stupid. Nobody knows where she lives. I met her at a bar. Which bar? Julius. Out in Santa Monica. How did she contact you? Called me at home. She's not such a bad dame. She treats you right. Sure, that's why you're in jail. Did you ever call her on the phone? I don't know her number. None of the kids do. She's smart. She taught me all I know about the racket. 
You'll have a rough time getting her. Maybe, but we'll get her. Ben and I left the office at 2 a.m. and went home to bed. We reported in at 8 that morning to Ed Backstrand. The three of us went down the street to Koken's restaurant for a cup of coffee. Nobody was in a good mood. We had most or all the small fry in the citywide burglary ring, but it seemed we were still a long way from cracking the inner circle. The latter kid said that none of them knows where she lives, what her phone number is, nothing. Pass the sugar, eh? Mm. I think we still have a few angles to study on that score. Right now, I've got some more bad news for you. What's that? You been through your mail this morning? No, not yet. We haven't had a chance. I saw the overnight reports. There were 32 car burglaries last night. 32. All the way from Wilmington to North Hollywood. How you figure it? I can't. This girl Myra must have an army of kids working for her. How much did they get, Ed? Any idea? Uh, rough estimate, about $3,000. Usual stuff people are foolish enough to leave in their cars. Watches, cameras, furs, expensive clothes. M.O.'s the same? Uh, like the others. If the car happens to have a rigid handle lock, they slip a piece of pipe over the handle for a lever and break it. If that doesn't work, they pry open the wing window. Some of the windows were smashed out. Sounds like you're in an awful hurry, Joe. Yeah, maybe this Myra wants a few big nights before she peddles the stuff and gets out. Uh, if we're going to get her, we can't waste time. Any suspects picked up last night, Skipper? None. Well, where did they hit most of the car? Outside the Pan Pacific. The parking lot. Hockey game going on. Must have been 4,000 cars for them to pick over. They picked the best. As usual. Well, you better get on it. Well, there's one way to handle it. What's that? She works fast. You work a little faster. We got back to the office and we went over the reports one by one. Then we called the young gang members to the interrogation room and questioned them separately and requestioned them. We got nowhere. Many of them had met Myra on the street, in the bar, but not one of them had any idea where she lived. At least that's what they told us. Ben had a hunch that Matthew Leiter knew more than he was telling. We had him brought to the interrogation room and all that afternoon until 10 o'clock that night with interruptions for his meal periods. We talked with Leiter. He would admit nothing more than what he'd already told us. Yeah, it's got me beat, Joe. Yeah. Now, let's check with Ed. Good morning, Joe. Ben? Hi, Mike. Skipper in? Just went down the hall for a minute. Be right back. Hold up a minute, will you? Yeah. Chief of Detectives, I was handing. Yeah. Well, you, Joe. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yeah. He does? We'll be right over. That was Sergeant Hopkins over at the jail. Yeah? Matthew Leiter's got something to tell us. Says it's important. Have a chair here, Leiter. Yeah, thanks. All right. You wanted to see us. I'm getting even with that dame Myra. I'm squaring with you. Yeah? She told me if I was picked up, she'd have me out in a couple of hours. She promised me a lawyer if anything happened. Said she'd get me bail. All right, where can we find her? I don't know if she's there now, but you can find out at Francisco Motors. Big used car lot. Garage, too. It's out on Melrose past La Cienica. What's the time? That's where she fenced most of the stuff we stole. Some old guy she buddies with runs the place. Big shop in the back. Store a lot of hot stuff there. Barney. Yeah, yeah, Sergeant. We're through with them. Take them back. <laughs> We checked with Chief Backstrand, and then we drove out to the Francisco Motor Company. We located it on the corner of Melrose and Geneva Avenue. It was a big layout. It consisted of a large used car lot sign bannering the slogan, Deluxe Auto Accessories, lowest prices in town. Along the back end of the lot, there was a large L-shaped garage. We found the man in charge, and he gave his name as Paul Hackett, the owner of the car lot. In the garage, we found the entrance to a large back storeroom was loaded with thousands of dollars worth of auto radios, spotlights, cratefuls of assorted car accessories. Special closets built into the walls of the garage contain racks of fur coats, suits, dresses. Below that, smaller boxes containing watches and cameras, all wrapped in tissue paper. You can save all of us a lot of time and trouble by talking to us now, Mr. Hackett. Where is Myra? I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain what we just found in your garage? I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was stolen. Well, which is it, Mr. Hackett? Make up your mind. I bought it. But I didn't know it was stolen. You can't prove I did know. I think we can prove it, Mr. Hackett. 
Some of those stolen car radios stored back there? The serial numbers are filed off, and this workbench here is full of filings. I... I didn't know... You'll have to do better than that. How does Myra figure in? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. It's all right with us, Hackett. We found the stuff, and we got you. If we don't find Myra, you'll be doing time for two people. Stand still. You can't. You can't do this to me. I, I don't know anything about it. Come on, Hackett. We're taking you in. All right, get in the car. Come on, in the car. Am I going to jail? You're going to jail. All right. I'll take you to Myra. Hackett told us that Myra lived at 1345 Munich Drive in Beverly Hills. He said that he was Myra's husband. He told us that he'd been in a legitimate garage business for 10 years before he married Myra. She talked him into the racket. He identified 1345 Munich Drive as their home. When we got there, we found stores of stolen property similar to those found in the garage. Myra was not there. Hackett had no idea where she might be. We sat down in the living room and waited. One hour, two hours, three hours. After five hours of waiting, the monotony started to wear on everybody's nerves, especially Hackett's. And the whole thing, it was her idea. I should have known, all hers. She did this to me. I won't take it alone. Where is she? You tell us, Hackett. I told you, I don't know. She couldn't have gone. She didn't know. I'm not going to take right, this quiet alone. Quiet down, quiet down. That you, Pa? Thought I heard you talking to some. Who's he? The police, Myra. The police. Your smart kids told them the whole story. What are you talking about, my smart kids? What are these cops All doing right, here in the living room? Oh, get your dirty hands off me. Get away. My kids are right, Joe. She got a damn Who do you think you're. Yeah, that ought to hold you for a while. All right, come on, you two. Let's go. All right, copper. You win. Stupid husband. How many times did I tell you? Don't trust those kids. Don't store the stuff in the garage. Don't open it for anybody. Get a lawyer. No, you knew better. Dumb jerk. The idea of having those cops camping in the living room waiting for me. Why didn't you warn me? I'm going to divorce you. That's what I'm going to do. I'll stick you for plenty. Jerk. All right, inside, you two. You got a smoke, Ben? Hmm. Yeah. Right here. Thanks. I was just thinking. What? Those kids were right. She's a pretty nice-looking woman. Yeah. Nice face. Beautiful figure. Mm-hmm. Sure talks a lot, though, doesn't she? Yeah. Hey, Joe, remind me to take home some flowers to my wife tonight, will you? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Paul and Myra Hackett were tried and convicted on seven separate counts of receiving stolen property. They are now serving out their sentences in the state penitentiary. Realizing that most of the young persons involved in the case were influenced by the strong personality of Paul and Myra Hackett, a separate investigation was made into the backgrounds and home life of the young offenders. In most cases, they were found to be basically good and they were placed on probation and returned to their homes. You have just heard the 13th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Detective Harry William Vosper of the Seattle, Washington Police Department who on the night of July 21st, 1949, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. And now, an important announcement. Starting this Saturday, September 3rd, Dragnet will be heard at a new time over your NBC station. Consult your local newspaper for the new listening time. And now, speaking in behalf of the producers and the entire cast of Dragnet, we would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your many kind letters of encouragement and approval. Remember, next Saturday for Dragnet, this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs>